Welcome. I'm Marilee Utter, Chair of the Counselors of Real Estate. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's episode in our What's Next webinar series, which we are pleased to be doing with Nareem today. Our topic is the business of real estate investment management. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Counselors of Real Estate, we are a global organization of accomplished leaders addressing the world's real estate challenges. Experienced, innovative, and credentialed problem solvers, counselors practice in 21 countries and offer expertise in 60 disciplines of all asset types. This webinar represents the very essence of the compelling and timely thought leadership the counselors are known for. Let me thank our 2022 sponsors for making this webinar possible. Altus Real Estate, Busak Real Estate, and Equus Capital Partners. If you would like to learn more about the Counselors of Real Estate and our thousand credentialed professionals, please visit our website at cre.org. And if you do that, you'll also have access to a complimentary subscription to our excellent professional journal, Real Estate Issues. So we really look forward to your, your participation and your questions in the webinar today. So please use that Q&A feature on your screen and we'll try to get to all the questions in the time that we have allotted. So let's get to it. It's my pleasure to introduce your moderator today, Jonathan Shine, CRE, CEO and Executive Director of the Real Estate Limited Partner Institute in New York. Jonathan's platform connects institutional investors, fund managers, operating companies, and organizations allied to the industry. But you may know him better as the founder of Globestreet.com, the real estate industry's online news and information website. He also created real estate, uh, real share conferences, which is one of the industry's largest events and conference groups. Jonathan, I'm going to hand it over to you to get us underway. Introduce our panelists. Thank you. thank you very much, and thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this on this important webinar. We have nearly 300 people registered from many different countries all over the world, and so let's get started. Uh, the overall mission of this webinar, as explained by Marilee, is to kind of give an insight, an inside look of how to uh, work with institutions and how to, who are the people that actually put these deals together with the institutions and the institutional private equity fund managers. It seems simple, but it's not, but we're going to try and break it down for you in somewhat smaller bites today. So I'd like to introduce our panel. I'd like them to introduce themselves. Oh, unfortunately, uh, one of our panelists could not make it uh, due to some late moment uh, situations, but we'll start with Sam, Sharon Ann Miller. Uh, could you please, and then we'll get to Chris. Please uh, go right ahead. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for that. And Marilee, always a pleasure to be with fellow CREs and appreciate the opportunity to partner with NARIM, one of our premier uh, industry organizations. My name is Sharon Ann Miller. Most of you know me as Sam Miller. I am the co-owner and president of Hillcrest Finance, and we provide uh, capital solutions for owners, operators, and developers across all property sectors across the U.S. Um, quite an interesting time for us um, because there is, while there's a lot of capital out there, there are also a lot of capital needs, and I think we'll dig into that with Jonathan's leadership. So really happy to be here today. Thank you, Sam. Chris? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a counselor and to um, be on this panel. Um, I'm an EVP at Samuels & Associates. I'm responsible for capital investment strategy. Uh, Samuels & Associates is a vertically integrated real estate investment company. We're focused on investing in urban cores, path growth markets, and broken retail transactions in the East Coast markets. Um, Drilling down a little bit to see what that means, um, we're, as a Boston-based developer, we're capable of executing on large, complex projects. And so logically, we're focused on life science, along with high-quality office that meets the needs of kind of the ever discerning tenant base today. Um, and we invest in mixed-use residential, particularly in places where we can leverage our placemaking expertise. These are mixed-use assets um, that allow us uh, uh, to apply our retail expertise, 
um, which runs deep into Samuel Associates DNA. Um, so these are some great asset types to I think be talking about today. I know they're of great interest to investors. Um, it's also briefly worth noting possibly that um, the newest member of Samuels and Associates um, and pr immediately prior to this, um, I was an institutional consultant uh, and most recently with NEPC, which is a general consultancy that advises over 400 institutional investors and about 1.4 trillion in assets under advisement. Okay, thank you, Chris. I guess the best place to start would to explain that an institutional investor, that's a big word, but when we break it down, we're really talking about endowments, foundations, pension funds, and how they can realize greater returns through their investment in real estate. And as counselors, how do we help them get there? So I'd like to start with, from that perspective, because a lot, of, a lot of people in the counselors may not understand or may even have the knowledge or know about how institutions really do fund so much of the real estate activity in this country. So why don't we start, Chris, I'd like to start with you. And I know that you, you just began this new position, but you know, with that background, knowing about you represented these institutions, the, the pension funds, endowments, and foundations, what exactly are they looking for? And what are you, what did you do for them when you were at your former organization? Sure. Um, the institutional investment world is, is not homogenous. I think oftentimes one of the mistakes people make is um, uh, not learning to tailor their messaging to those individual investor types. There's a whole wide gamut. Like I said, NEBC has 400 clients that range from endowments and foundations to public and corporate pension funds. There's sovereign wealth funds, there's high net worth uh, offices um, and a whole other, you know, in life insurance, healthcare. Taft Hardleys. These are all various types that have different um, needs. And that's what we try to do as consultants, as investors, trying to sort out what are their needs and how can we meet them. Some have needs that, you know, they want core assets because they need the income. They can't take the risk of development or what have you. And others use real estate as um, a way of, you know, getting more high octane returns that they're maybe not getting in their fixed income portfolios, for example. Um, like the insurance companies and healthcare companies. Um, and so, um, and some or others are board burdened by certain regulatory or um, investment guidelines that restrict how they invest. So what we do is we try to figure out uh, for each of our clients what their hard spots and soft spots are, um, help them structure a program that will meet those needs, and then go out and identify those managers that will, that will help meet those needs, help fill the buckets um, of risk profiles and duration and income and so forth. Um, and so that's kind of the main thrust of it in broad strokes. We can, we can drill in from there. Okay, thanks, Chris. So Sam, on the other side, when you deploy capital, that, that capital comes from someplace. And usually in your wor world, it comes from the people Chris or may or may not have represented. So can you kind of walk us through the journey as well? From your perspective, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Chris is spot on. The the different types of capital have different goals and objectives. So as we're trying to figure out on our side what's the best strategy to recommend to them, we have to keep those things into consideration. We also have a whole other set of clients that we consider, and that's our owners, operators, and developers, the people who are actually seeking the capital and what their goals and objectives are. And so our primary goal is to make sure we are matching and or providing solutions for our owners, operators, and developers that will also provide a great risk-adjusted return for our investors. So we look at a whole myriad of things. We have to look at all the things that Chris looks at when we're taking the capital in and making sure that we can match that with the goals and objectives of our um, operating partners. And they vary. We, um, we like to say that we're agnostic to property sector, which is not true because as many of you know, I, I have an opinion about everything and so does my partner, but that's a good thing right? Because we take in con into consideration our 35 years plus of experience, as well as what's going on in the marketplace right now and where we see things going. And we try to make sure we keep that in mind when we're working with our operating partners. Um, so we have um, preferences, but also we have preferences in markets. So I would say we look at it from a relative value perspective as well, because we look at market dynamics as well. We only focus on the U.S., um, but there are certain dynamics and trends 
um, that are going on in the markets that we see consistently throughout. And we can kind of match those with the real estate dynamics and the fundamentals to come up with what we think are the trends and where we will see the greatest value. And then we do a relative value discussion as well. For example, multifamily might be great in one market. Um, and maybe not so great in another market. That's probably not true because multifamily is great in all markets, but maybe hotel or office may be great in one market, but, but we maybe wouldn't want to do it in another market. So we try and make those relative value decisions as well. So like Jonathan said, it is a process and it starts with what's the capital trying to accomplish and what are our operating partners really wanting to accomplish with their investments? Great. And a, a counselor without an opinion isn't really a counselor. So that's okay. <laughs> so I, I also encourage our audience uh, to please send any questions throughout throughout the, uh, the seminar because we want to hear from you because it can't just be about us. So with that, why don't we get into why don't we dive into some of the property specific investments and dynamics behind them right now? Chris, even though um, you're pretty much Boston, Massachusetts centric, I believe, you still uh, yeah, mostly New England um, and some other East Coast markets. But yes, we are um, headquartered yeah. and that is our primary focus um, is the greater Boston area. OK, so but still within that, you have to come up with a rationale for investment. So it makes sense. So the cap rates and you're, you're, you're bringing money out and your investors are happy. Can you talk about some of the whether it's property type or location type? What are the types of things you look at? Because we want to help our audience help you. Awesome. I always can use all the help I can get. Um, look, I'll start with a kind of a macro thinking about institutional investors. There has been a trend for a while now from an institutional investor's perspective to, to do kind of two things. Historically, uh, institutional investors focused on kind of the, what we call the traditional four, office, multifamily, residential, and industrial. But as more capital has come into the industry, uh, chasing those deals, they've become priced pretty dear, as we all know. Um, and that capital has looked for other places to go. And then also certain trends have um, put other, you know, some of those four, those core four sectors out of favor. Um, as we all know, retail's been out of favor for a while, um, as an example. Um, an office now more recently since the pandemic is, you know, surrounded by question marks. But what we've, but we've seen as a trend, and, you know, this is one that's really only been accelerated by the pandemic, is institutional investors looking more towards niche, what were form, formerly niche asset classes. You know, no one really knew what self-storage was 10 years ago from an institutional perspective. Now it's finding its way in all the portfolios. Life science. People didn't have a great appreciation for that. Now they've just figured out, well, all office isn't the same. Life sciences office, but that's a really unique type of office. And it's an office type that um, requires highly specialized features. Um, and those jobs can't be easily performed from home. Um, and so retail, it's another category. Um, investors have come to learn that not all retail is the same. Uh, you know, a grocery anchored retail is, is different than the malls. Um, and so um, that's what we're seeing as a broad trend is a greater appreciation for the subtypes of the, the core four and then appreciation for new asset types um, that, that didn't really exist um, in institutional portfolios you know, about a decade ago, including single family rentals, right? That didn't exist until right after the global financial crisis from an institutional perspective. And so we're looking at all those. We're a very opportunistic investor. So uh, life science was, uh, you know, very, uh, important driver of the Boston economy. And so, you know, now we have millions of square feet under development, uh, in the Fenway and, and throughout Boston. Um, and we're able to leverage our expertise expertise. That's an area where we said, well, wait a minute, we can do that. Our development teams are very capable of, you know, executing on these. And in fact, right now we're doing a project that's capping the Mass Pike, which is a major artery uh, going west to east. Um, and I think that's a great example of um, the specialized skills it takes to execute on some of these asset types. You know, we're building a 500,000 square foot, 21 story office building. That'll be a mix of traditional office, new, modern, desirable office space, but also life science. And then there'll be a hotel across the way. And in between, we're going to build a park over the mass pipe, over this major artery. Um, and so 
that's how we're meeting our investor to, yeah, investors' needs is figuring out what are the right asset types to be in and then building the right product that tenants want. Great. Thank you for that. Now, now Sam, uh, I actually want to make a point. You brought up a point that you know, self-storage wasn't even a, an asset class at all 10 years ago. Just think about this in 2008. Whoever heard of Sam? Uh, single family rentals. Now it's one of the biggest asset classes attracting capital right now. So things change and they change rapidly. Sam, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, look, I remember when we were fighting for real estate as an asset class in a multi-asset class portfolio back in the late 80s, early 90s. So you are right, Jonathan, things um, certainly do evolve and real estate has its place. And now within real estate, um, like I think Chris was um, alluding to, there are multi strategies within real estate whether it's debt, equity, different property sectors, different markets, different phases of the life of an asset, whether it's fully stabilized or if it's a development project. So, um, you know, I think as I look at the evolution since, um, since the mid 80s, I, we're, we're more sophisticated, um, but I think we're still, there's still a lot of information that is not shared broadly, right? Because a lot of real estate is still owned privately. So it's really, we really rely on each other, right, to share information and make sure that we have the mind share and we understand what's going on in the marketplace. And I think that's what allows us to look across markets, find those similarities in trends, whether it's demographic trends or drivers, um, look across markets and identify those so that we can kind of make um, investments across markets and actually take a look at new investments. So for example, um, the single family, so like Chris said, multifamily, industrial, forget about it. They're the darlings, they'll always be the darlings. When there's a bump in the road, maybe they take a little hit, but they come back strong for yeah. various reasons. People always have to live someplace and industrial is one of those things where you can in the back of the day, it used to be where we could build it quickly. And if something went wrong, we could shut it down, right? We could stop building because, uh, because of what it, uh, the footprint. Now, the industrial has become even more important to us because of that. And I like to blame it on my daughter's generation that I need it right now when I want it. So that kind of last mile delivery in the moment and I'm going to take it away from her and put it on me. I needed something yeah. really quickly the other day. And I was like, Amazon, get it to me in two hours. So I think that's become more and more important. And I think the important note is, is that it's the evolution of these property sectors that we're dealing with now. So the way we're investing in multifamily, we're still doing it but we're investing in it differently. Single family, residential follows the demographic. And it's not just our generation, me and you, Jonathan, right? The empty nesters and we're moving on and we want to get rid of that big house. It's younger folks too are saying that, you know what? I don't want to be wedded to one place, but I want to live in a home. So I'm going to rent a single family rental and then I'm going to move on and rent someplace else. Um, and it's the same thing with industrial. So we like all of those property sectors, just like um, Chris is mentioning, um, you still have to underwrite the underlying, you know, kind of fundamentals to make sure that those things are still strong. And I think one of the things, and maybe you're going to get into it, this with us, that we have to add into the mix is the owner operator themselves and what's their wherewithal, what's their history and track record in executing that strategy, um, maybe in that market or not, you know, if they have a track record of executing that strategy, it can be transferable to other markets is really important. And we saw that even more than before during this last global pandemic, having the strength of a strong operating partner next to you when stuff just went haywire. And I'll just, I'll just add on to that, Sam. I, I 100% agree. That's really what we're always looking for is or thoughtful managers that um, aren't just saying, well, I can do this because uh, it's in my backyard or something. It's, you know, I can do this. And then they can articulate a really good reason why they're well positioned to do this. And I shouldn't be going 
to one of the many, many, many other managers I could be going to. Um, so it's all about articulating your differentiating factors and, and being honest with yourself and um, not just kind of throwing everything out there that and seeding your raise capital around it. That's right. Great. Well, actually, that leads into our first question from the audience. And Sam, I also want to thank you for defining my age demographic. I feel much better about this. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to be out here on my own. So. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the question. And actually, this is great. Uh, how does one access institutional funds? Private. You know, we know where we're getting the capital from, but all these brokers are from the broker and developer standpoint. How do they find these uh, private equity fund managers? Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Chris, you want to take a shot? No, actually, Sam, how, how do they find you? Or how do you find them? I was going to say, Sam, you got a fund? <laughs> 203. Put your, put your number right at the bottom here. Let it scroll across, Sam. <laughs> 203. Um, look, it is, that is not, and I think Jonathan said it before, it's the institutional world it's not an easy world to navigate because there's so many, and Chris alluded to it as well, there's so many different nuances between the different capital types, but we're out there. Look, traditionally financing solutions have been banks, right? And major financial, financial institutions. The global financial crisis happened. Those guys kind of changed, right? Banks pulled back. Some of the ones that we're used to went away. And so then there's the onset of um, other types of capital sources. I think our firm is an alternative capital source. I will say that we are not the cheapest, but we are the most flexible and trying to provide solutions. So sometimes, you know, you, you, you have to make a decision kind of where you want to be. Do you want somebody that's going to be by your side when stuff goes down? For example, when we just had the global pandemic, I mean, we sat shoulder to shoulder with our banking partners because we sometimes provide MES financing. So we'll come alongside of, you name it, like a Bank of America who says, oh, we're only going to give XYZ operator up to 55% of the capital stack. Well, that doesn't mean that they still don't need, you know, up to 75%. So we'll sit alongside them and provide that solution. And when things go bad, we all sit at the table together to provide those solutions. So access to capital varies. Um, going the direct route to public pension plans, I think is tough if it's your first time doing it because there are a lot of what do you want to call it, Chris? Like boxes to check, maybe? Uh. Yes. Yeah. I always say <laughs> right? there's certain, there's a whole bunch of, you know, I used to have 400 uh, clients. Um, the more boxes you check, the more doors I can open for you. Right. Um, and so that's something you need to, to do as a manager. You need to start figuring out what are all the boxes I can check right. um, and making sure that you're, um, you're checking as many as that you reasonably can. Um, and then, um, there are lots of ways to access the capital. There are, I'll put a plug in, first of all, for the counselors. Um, you know, it's a really well-connected group of, of people. So if you know a counselor, um, one of the reasons I joined and I love the counselors is that, and this is true, I can pick up the phone and call any counselor out there and I can say, hey, I'm a counselor from Boston. If I don't know them already, we haven't met at one of our in-person events, which in the last couple of years has been, been tough. Um, they'll pick up the phone. And if they don't have the answer, they are always so willing to put um, them in, in, in touch with, put me in touch with the right person. And so oftentimes probably the counselors would put you in touch with me and I would, I could help you. Um, or there are placement agents, people specifically geared towards raising capital. Um, you know, they have a large roller decks. Um, going the direct route, as Sam said, is, is really hard. If you're, if you don't have connections, it is, um, it is a, oh, sorry, Jonathan, but I'll just wrap up. It's yeah. still very much real estate. It's a, it's a people business, you know, it's who, you know, and um, what people think of you and your reputation is everything. Um, and so that hasn't changed. And that's particularly so when people are trusting you with their money. What I, I think uh, to get even more to the property level aspect, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. how, does, how does a broker on the ground or a developer on the ground or someone who's thinking of, you know, buying a piece of dirt, access the services of say, a Sharon, a Sam, I keep saying Sharon. Yeah. I mean, yep. Sam, how does someone find you? Yeah, there are the industry associations such as the councils of real estate, pension real estate association, yep. and mm -hmm. national association of real estate investment managers is also our co-sponsor for this event, but it's not really a plug for them, but how does the property developer all the way on the ground 
find you. Right. So we always say that we we like to um, triangulate, right? We have relationships with banks who have relationships with the owners directly. So some owners, operators, developers out there, you have a banking relationship. Start with them, right? Because they are going to be a source of financing. Um, so we have relationships with them. We have direct relationships with a lot of owners and operators, like I alluded to earlier. I'm old. I've been doing this for a long time. So I have a lot, 35 years worth of relationships on that side. So that way, so your peers, um, brokers, we like, there's a, whether we have the relationships directly or with the banks or not, there's always a broker in the deal, right? So, um, so that's a way to get in touch. We are very active in all of the, our industry um, uh, organizations. So I'm a, I'm a counselor. I'm very active with the counselors. I'm available. My number is available. And I, I am the person who will not, like Chris was saying, I'm not going to tell you I can do something if I can't do it. But I will most certainly refer you to somebody who can. So if we talk through a, a, a problem, and it doesn't have to be a problem, a project, let's say that if we talk through a project, and I'm like, look, right now, my capital doesn't do that. But here are three names, five names of people who I know have capital for that. Let me refer you to them. So that's a great way to do it. Priya, that's the pension um, organization. It's um, a way that you can see I think when you're, if you're first getting into it as an owner operator developer, it's a great way to see all of the different types of pension plans that are out there. Um, they're, the majority of them are public pension plans. So the Nysters, the Calsters, the PERS, all of that. Um, that's a great way to see who's out there. And then you can kind of start to navigate your way through that. Um, NAREAM is another one, and that's one. Um, NAREAM focuses on specialties, industry specialty or functional specialties. So are you a portfolio manager, acquisitions officer? So they have a, a, a functional area and group that meets for everybody. Another way to do it. Um, um, what's it? The MBA, right? The Mortgage, Mortgage Bankers Association is another one. CREPC, that's the financing people. They're, that's where all the banks and all of the kind of financing people meet and gather annually. So there are industry organizations, but I agree with Chris. I think the counselors, because we are smaller, um, it's a more intimate group. Um, some might say we are a little bit longer in the tooth. Um, so we probably have a lot of other connections is a great way to start. And I'm available. <laughs> okay. And also, I'll just talk from more of the equity side then. Um, you know, there are basically, there are kind of, I'll say, I'll try to simplify it to three ways. You can try to go direct to the large pension funds and institutional investors. That's not a likely path unless you have some sort of vehicle they can invest in, um, or they're the largest of the large investors that can do kind of direct deals in your assets, in your specific investment, if you have a single investment. So then you need to find uh, what we call allocators. These are um, funds, investment managers who've gone out and done the work of raising capital from whatever institutional source that is. And it's their job to find operating partners that are best in class in their asset type or their market or their markets. And then they allocate that institutional capital that ends up creating what's called a double promote or double fee structure. Um, so they'll get a promote from the institutional investor and you'll get a, a promote and a fee um, from that person. And then the last way um, that I, you know, keeping things kind of broad strokes, rules of three, um, is the emerging manager programs. There are what are called emerging manager programs. Um, uh, and I can, I can list off some names of those. Artemis has one. Grosner has one. Um, Oak Street has one. You can go to them. They also have gone out and gotten capital from institutional managers, but with the specific goal of investing that in um, emerging managers, those managers that have a first time fund um, or that wish to ultimately one day get into that fund universe, but just aren't ready yet. Um, and, and they will, they have programs specifically designed to help mentor you and train you and get you uh, kind of camera ready for the institutional, you know, direct access capital. That's great. So first, uh, 
we're going to finish up shortly on accessing capital, and then we're going to get more into a little bit of property type. But while we're promoting the counselors of real estate, <laughs> I didn't mean to make it a big plug for them so much. It Sorry, is our, it is our webinar. If you go to CR, if you go to cre.org and it says <laughs> find a CRE, you go to the scroll down menu and it says investment management. It's right there, and you're going to meet so many professionals can help you access this type of capital or at least walk you through the journey of getting to find out if you want this kind of capital. So one of the questions, the final, I'm gonna go with the final uh, question about capital at this moment. You know, so many of these, uh, our members and people who are signed on don't have the $100 million portfolios. They're looking to maybe access $3 million for a development deal in a market that maybe, you know, it's not a major urban core market. How would, is, is institutional capital looking for that kind of, um, investment, or are they looking for something larger, or are there parts of institutional investment and these fund managers that will go into a deal on that size level? Sam? Yeah, you know, I think it is it it varies. Um, a lot of the large institutional investors, they're not going to do. They like to write big checks. That's what they say. They like to write big checks, and when I say big checks, it's like. $100 million, you know, they're like, if we're going to invest in a fund, we want to invest in, in, in a big way, because it takes a lot to get to the point where, like Chris was saying, that you trust the manager, you want to give them $100,000, that's a big process, and they don't want to keep doing that over and over again. So I would say for um, smaller sized projects, not any less meaningful, just smaller sized projects, that route is probably not the way, unless there is a, um, like a pipeline, you know what I mean? And you can come up with a programmatic type of structure to go with those in larger investors. They love those, right? So you could say, we have a pipeline of, you know, a hundred million this year, and then it's going to be 150 next, you know, so on and so forth. And so that is something that is also to be considered. So you don't necessarily have to be in the fund business. Everybody doesn't want to be in the fund business, right? Because it's, it's, you know, it's the fund business. It's great. And you eliminate those kind of double promotes and all of those. And there's a great, you know, kind of fee and in, in, in a, a success fee model. But some people also just want to do deals, right? They just want to do direct deals. So you can formulate a joint venture, a programmatic joint venture with some of these larger public pension plans so that they know that, hey, I may not be able to place 200 million day one, but over five years, I'm gonna place you know, a, a significant amount of money. So, um, so that's those guys. Then there are um, endowments and foundations. I think that's also a great route for smaller, um, more focused, whether it's regional or property sector type owners, operators, and developers, because those tend to be, um, this is definitely not a knock on any of the public pension plans, but they're a little bit more agile and a little, you know, they, they, they want to do um, things that are not just kind of down the mainstream. They'll, they have a, their risk tolerance maybe a little bit greater. And so they might want to do some projects on a one-off basis. Uh, and their endowments are smaller, right? So they're, the dollars that they have to put out um, are smaller. So that's also, I think, a really great route. And then um, uh, family offices, ultra high net worths and family offices, phenomenal. So when I'm thinking about the non-institutional, so not the, the non-large um, owner operators and developers, the regular folks like all of us, right? You, I would start with, family offices, ultra high net worth individuals, those type of people, then I would go to endowments and foundations and then kind of creep up that way. I don't know, what do you think about that, Jonathan and Chris, as a just kind of a step of yeah. how to maybe start accessing yeah. a little bit more institutional capital. So you start with passing it around, you know, to friends and family and all right. of that, but then you go to the next step, which would be the ultra high net worth, and then the next step, the family offices, and then like that. Yeah, I think that's more Chris Chris's uh, field since he just was doing that for so many years. Uh, I'll say, um, yeah, someone had a question in the Q&A that said, well, if I have a deal, I need $3 million. Um, I'm assuming they're just going to mean equity for the purposes of this. Um, 
that's a really small check size for what we're, you know, this institutional investor world that we're talking about. So um, Sam is right there. You're, you're much better off going with the family offices. Those are uh, offices either for an individual uh, high, uh, what we call an ultra high net worth individual or multifamily offices that manage, a, manage the money of many of those. Um, they're often able to be much more nimble um, and they're more you know, deal focused, individual transaction focused. Um, and you're now talking about a, a sweet spot for size of checks that they can write um, because they too care about things that the big institutions care about, diversification, et cetera. They might have a hundred million dollars from across all of their um, high net worths to put out, but they don't want to put that in one deal. Um, you know, they want to find a bunch of, um, of, of smaller deals to, to get that diversification. Um, and, and the high net worths are willing to take, you know, they, they, they became oftentimes that wealthy because they did um, take some um, unique bets. And so they're willing to sometimes take those unique, unique bets that institutions don't. Institutional investors, you know, they have a board and, and oftentimes public opinion um, to, to contend with. And so they have to be a lot more uh, judicious in, in how and to whom they put the money out. And there's another aspect to working with ultra high net worth and family offices, which is also the tax transfer and wealth transfer issue, which a lot of the foundations and endowments and pension funds just don't fall into. And so yep. you're dealing with, and you're dealing on another level wealth management, which is definitely a different track. Mm -hmm. So let's they get up. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. So that, that is the thing that you'll want to start thinking about is just what is your risk profile? The high net worths, for example, have a tendency to not want as much income producing real estate because that gets... Um, ordinary income, you know, treatment, ordinary tax income tax treatment, which, as we all know, is not as good as getting capital gains treatment. And so they do have a tendency to favor more opportunistic development strategies and what have you, because um, you'll get more favorable tax treatment. But when you're talking to public pension plans, they they don't care about taxes, right? That's not a concern for them. Let's just pivot a little bit. Pivot a little over just the property type, and then we can finish up with capital raising again. What what what? properties are really hot. We talked about single family rental and we've talked about logistics and multifamily, but you know, there are others out there that we're not talking about, but are still hot. Not everything is, but when someone comes to you, like Sam, someone says, I, I looking for capital right now, where, where are you going to just say no versus where are you going to say yes? Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, where, so, where is that office, though? Is it in the urban core, or is it in suburban? Where Where are we looking? Right. So, I and I want to I want to start out by saying this with respect to office. We don't know. Okay. So that's the bottom line. We don't know. We have all of these numbers out there, and you know whatever. We don't know. And the bottom line is, we have got to wait and see how companies are going to retool themselves. What are the companies saying about how they want to be working? And we can't just look at the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world because they can control any environment, right? So that's not the standard. So when they come out with whatever their policies are, that's great. But think about the 5,000 to, you know, or the 250 square foot to the 5,000 square foot tenant, different model, right? Different business model. So let's not try and just focus on what they're saying. So I think we have some work to do there. That being said, like we talked about before, there are other trends that we can follow, things that were actually happening before the global pandemic, right? People, I, I'm Connecticut, taxes, horrible, right? So people were leaving Connecticut by the droves because of the because of taxes. So all of this kind of migration to more tax friendly areas was happening before the demographic, my daughter's demographic, who I blame everything on, you know, they're all moving to places where they want to be. You know, they don't want to be necessarily in the burbs of Connecticut. They want to be other places. All of those things, all of those trends were happening before. I think the global pandemic just gave it a kick in the rear. Right. And so it just kind of accelerated. So when I think about office, which hey, look, we like office, you know, and I'm using my air quotes, um, but it's got to have kind of all of those, they, it's got to fit all of those trends, right? So for example, we just did um, a multi-building 
office complex in Santa Ana, California. So it's that kind of low rise stuff, you know, two, three stories, eight, you know, atrium, whatever. And it's an office complex. Um, tenants, government tenants, and not government tenants that were relying on appropriations or anything like that. So kind of real government tenants that that had their own um, P&L and capital source, uh, revenue source and base, um, and right next to an Amazon distribution center. Sure. Kind of easy, right? We did that all day long. And our sponsor was a fabulous sponsor, well-known international um, investment manager. So all of those things were great. And it was... 55% LTV. Can't really go wrong with that. And they wanted, um, yeah, it was 55% LTV. And that was a first. So it won't go anywhere from equity all the way up to preferred equity, which looks like equity. So we like that. We have concerns about what's happening in the city. We're based in the city. We love the city, but we have concerns about what's going on in the city. You see these numbers saying that the office space in the city is coming back. There is quite a bit of activity. Look deeper. Shorter terms is a big thing now. People are not committing to these five, 10 year leases. It's shorter term because why they're trying to figure out how are we going to work? What's our workforce going to look like? Um, so we're a little weary of that, but we're watching it because we do think it's an opportunity. We do think it's a great opportunity. Also, the TIs that are involved. And I just want the rest of the audience to know when, when Sam says the city, she meant New York City. Oh, I'm so sorry. That is so. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very New Yorker of you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Chris, up I there. I apologize to every Look, single uh, person uh, out there that is not from New York. Yeah. Um, so, asset types. Okay. So, I'll just follow up before I get into asset types real quick what Sam said. You know, there are certain markets that, um, and I'll use Boston as an example because that's where we're based. I, I'm never going to bet against Boston. You know, long term, there are just too many drivers of success. Demographics of destiny. You know, the education centers, tech centers, healthcare centers, um, the Southeast, where there are other factors like lower taxes, um, in migration, uh, more favorable um, uh, zoning requirements, et cetera, that you know, make development easier. Some of those things are, are really helping you know, drive those markets. So look for where um, demographics are in your favor. And that applies not just to the regions that you're investing in, the cities you're investing in, but the asset type. So residential is a prime example. Um, the long-term average for housing in America is one and a half million homes a year. That's multifamily and single family homes. That's going back 50 years from the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, since the global financial crisis, we have yet to hit that number. So we've had, you know, more than a decade long under investment in housing, just at the same time as millennials are long at last. Uh, Sam, your daughter will be forming a household soon. Um, and uh, they're doing it at a time when uh, affordability is hard. Prices are, are high. Um, they have college debt. Um, getting a mortgage is not easy as it used to be, and not just because interest rates are rising, but because of all the uh, requirements that we didn't have when I first bought my house many, 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 many years ago. Um, and so residential is an area that even if there are blips in the short term, there's just going to take many years to dig our way out of that hole. Same thing, life science or healthcare. Those are areas we have an aging population that is living longer. Um, so that requires more healthcare office. Um, life science, we, you know, all of these uh, people, all of the people that are living longer, that's because of technologies that are being developed uh, and manufactured in life science facilities. So those are areas that are, you know, not going to change. We've already, so on e-commerce demographics, again, we've hit peak globalization. We've learned that supply chain issues um, are, are just that, they could be real issues um, and affect your business model. And so there will be this continued uh, demand to, to have more um, just in case inventory here in the US. So that will continue to favor industrial. So I think demographics is always a great place to start to look as to where you want to invest. And then, then there are opportunities, you know, retail's a prime example. Has it been oversold? Are we painting it with too broad of a brush? You know, I think five years ago, if you talked to institutional investors, they would have said no retail at all. Everybody's, you know, cutting back their exposure. Just, it was hard to 
it was hard to justify telling one of my clients back then, hey, here's a retail fund. Um, and even if I did get excited about it, I couldn't get them excited about it. Um, but now everybody's starting to appreciate, wait, there's, you know, th there is, you know, for experiential, unique retail, you know, we're, our, we're officed in the Fenway in Boston, which is um, such an you know, exciting dynamic neighborhood to be in. Uh, multifamily, of course, during the pandemic had a lot of vacancy, but already our buildings are now, you know, 97, 100% occupied and the streets are bustling again because people do ultimately want to, you know, live in dynamic, exciting communities. Um, and, and retail will present opportunities for people, people who can figure out how to buy those malls that have been overbuilt and turn them inside out and put some multifamily there. That's a great opportunity for people. I've um, been hearing more from some people about, you um, uh, all sorts of way to maybe do last mile logistics in them, um, well, micro, know, micro fulfillment centers, for example. You bring up a very good point on repurposing real estate. Mm -hmm. Spread that Hudson Bay company. I think it's Hudson Bay or Hudson Pacific. I forgot that's taking its Lord, Lord and Taylor retail out and turning them and did a deal with WeWork. So there's many different things that can be done. And creatively speaking, if you have the, the will behind you, you will be able to access this capital from certain fund managers. Uh, and that, that brings up another question, you know, at what stage in a development project is best to seek an institutional investor? Um, at what stage? I mean, obviously, entitlement is always a better place than unentitled, but maybe you could uh, give us some, some examples. I mean, some of the example projects are manufacturing growth, printing, corporate park, regional development. At what stage is it really ideal to seek out institutional capital? I think that really depends on your business model, right? So there are, there are plenty of uh, investment managers out there that have funds that have discretion. You know, they've already got investors behind them that say, hey, you're experienced in, in doing this. So you build a box of, hey, this is what I'm going to buy. Um, it's called a blind pool uh, fund. So you raise the fund where there are no specific assets in it already, but you know you have a track record of, of doing development and what have you. And so they're going to give you money to call over a two to three year investment period. Um, so that's one way. If you're talking about you know truly kind of land speculating and what have you, that's a much longer uh, time frame. Um, that doesn't suit itself very well for a fund format because um, fund, you know, typically development funds, opportunistic funds are closed end, meaning they're finite life vehicles somewhere in the seven to 10 to 12 years. Um, and so if you're talking about a project that, you know, may take four or five years to get, you know, entitled and rezoned um, and then you got to build it and then you got to lease it. Um, that might not fit itself so neatly into a fund format. So really, I hate to be that guy that says it depends, um, but this is why you do need experts and, you know, whether it's um, a counselor or whether it's a placement agent or, or whoever else it is, um, they can help you sort out um, their other advisors too. Um, they can help you sort out kind of what's right for you. Um, and just because, you know, your, your, you know, your friend, you know, down the street who you do business with occasionally, he or she just raised a fund and, and it's all working well for them doesn't mean it's going to work out well for you. So don't just race towards that thinking that's the answer then uh, that's going to fix my problems. You have to be more thoughtful about that because institutional investors will see through that. They'll see, you know, that, hey, this, uh, this square peg is not fitting in this round hole. If that's what you're trying to accomplish, you're not thoughtful enough. And also just, just for the audience to understand, placement agent is also known as a capital markets expert in some of the larger uh, firms and some of the smaller firms that help you access capital. And that's really what a placement agent's role is. Sam? Um, so uh, different stages. It's all about, for us, risk, right, and return. And, and that's what our capital is, is, is focused on, right? So how much risk are they willing to take and how much you're going to get for that? Um, there, there, are, there is capital available for early stage development projects, very expensive and not readily available just because there's a lot of risk there. Like Jonathan said, anything that's entitled is great. If you just have to go through and get the, you know, box checks and the signatures, then people are willing to do that. I think this whole idea of um, land banking, like, uh, like Chris said, 
big lesson learned from the global financial crisis, land does not belong in a finite life fund, bottom line. So it's really tough to do any kind of land speculation um, and, and, and capital um, investment in, in a fund structure like that, unless it's a specific fund for land and it's like a 20 year fund or something like that, which nobody's gonna, not nobody, a lot of people, there's, there's not a lot of that out there. So I think it's very difficult to get that kind of capital. Now, that being said, there are some banks and some um, that will entertain it and they will come up with a structure with a MES partner or preferred equity partner to provide um, that type of capital. So, um, so that land piece is, is probably the toughest sector um, for us to be able to place capital for just because of the level of risk involved and the level of tolerance um, that, that investors have um, for that type of investment. And then um, how much skin in the game do you require from your partners? Yeah, it, de it, it depends. Um, <laughs> like Chris said, I don't want to be the person that says it depends, but it does. Um, but we, <clears throat> you got to have, and, and it's got to be meaningful skin in the game, right? So it can't be land value or anything like that. You have to have real capital. That's also one of the lessons learned. One of the positive lessons learned for us in particular, and I'm sure other people during this last um, you know, global pandemic, is that our partners had meaningful equity in the deals. And so in, in order for them to walk away would have been extraordinarily painful, right? So having meaningful capital in the deal, and that could range. I mean, we, we will look at, um, again, it, it all depends on what the business plan is, what the expertise is of the um, owner operator developer, what the market dynamics are, where we are in the cycle. We will look at things, you know, kind of sort of up to 85 to 90, but there's a lot that goes into that. That structure on the upper end of it, there's probably going to be a little kicker at the end. So that's going to be a preferred equity structure with a little, we want to participate on the upside. Um, the more typical, it's going to be up to the 80, kind of 80, 85 percent for multifamily and industrial, a little bit less for hotel. And we didn't talk about hotel. We love hotel um, um, in the right market with the right partners and all of that. So the amount of capital uh, equity varies um, okay. based on project. And so this. Oh, yeah. Go, Chris. Oh, I'll just say, yeah. Uh, there was a kind of an obsession for a while that, you know, the uh, managers had to have X percent, 10 percent, 5 percent, 20 percent. There is no number. It is exactly as Sam said. We want it just to be meaningful to your organization. We want to know that you're you have real skin in the game. And, and that's long and short of it. I um, for all the years that I consulted to institutional investors, I, I beat that drum pretty loudly. So, so some even heard it. <laughs> so say, just say, one of our audience members raises this capital for from either a private equity real estate fund or directly from the institution. What kind of capital is this? And what I mean is from one of the questions in the audience is, is it passive capital? What do they expect from the investor? Uh, and on what level? I mean, because most, I, I know when we all come out of the real estate business, it can't be done on an Excel spreadsheet anymore. Okay, you don't send, send a, what, what, what happens? What, what are they looking for? What kind of transparency, or what kind of reporting are they looking for? Because this could scare about half of the audience away, right? <laughs> so that's one of the things that, um, that we were alluding to before. Everyone's not made for the fun business because the reporting is palpable. You know, there <laughs> is reporting that has to occur. And, you know, as real estate people, we're looking at it a lot of times from a, this is a great transaction. And that is probably true, but that does not mean that you can get out of doing the reporting and the reporting is palpable. It varies um, from institution to institution, but it's something like 
um, uh, on a quarterly basis, you provide, you know, quarterly financials on the transaction and you maybe do like a little write up with market information and anything that's changed at the property, then you do annual audited financials. So there, you know, it can vary from just like a two pager to a 20 pager um, and, and it's at a minimum. And, and this is how we report is quarterly. Transparency is high and is critical uh, across the board because like Chris said earlier, they are trusting you and your capabilities. And in return for that, they expect a detailed and transparent reporting structure. I mean, some funds have what we call LPACs, limited partner uh, committees that, um, are there to support the manager if in fact there are any decisions that need to be made that may be controversial or may be a conflict. So those are in place. So there are a lot of different types of uh, reporting, but the transparency is expected to be on high. A lot of managers are expected to be registered as registered investment advisors with the, with the SEC. Um, there are some exemptions for size and all of that, but you know some kind of controls that the uh, capital source can rely on and has some familiarity with. Yeah, well, so Chris, now that you're on this side of ledger, how you enjoy <laughs> that transparency thing? <laughs> Uh, look, I think uh, to, the answer is it's legally passive um, from a, you know, from the, put my lawyer hat on for a second. The capital is passive. Um, it doesn't want to take guarantee risk or things like that. That's going to be on you as the manager um, to take those risks. Um, but as a practical matter, most capital is not passive. They want to be informed. Um, and, uh, you know, I got into the consulting world. I was on the manager side of things pre-global financial crisis and got on the institutional investor consulting side post-global financial crisis. And um, one of my clients, you know, said it best. It's those managers that took us along for the ride, explained to us, didn't let us have surprises that we stuck with through thick and thin, even when things did ultimately you know, fail or, or go sideways. Um, those managers that, you know, met with them every quarter and said everything's good. And then all of a sudden, oh, the bank took it back. Never will see a, you know, a dime of capital from institutional investors again. Um, and so there is no replacement for, for communicating and treating your investors, even if they're legally passive limited partners as partners. Well, I think we may be out of time because our chair, Meryl Lee, is back. <laughs> I hate to cut it off because it's been such a great conversation. It's so helpful. Um, really, really interesting to, to um, hear you guys go into the details of how this industry works and how to work with that industry and get the most out of it. So I can't thank you enough, Jonathan, Sam, and Chris. You did really a great job today. Recordings of the of this session will be sent to all the program registrants and they're also available for others at, at our website cre.org. Please plan to join us for our follow-on webinar on May 18th. Our topic that day will be institutional investment and talent management. Really a hot topic in this industry. I mean, every industry right now. Um, if you'd like to register, again, go to the website cre.org. So until then, and on behalf of the counselors of real estate and NARIM, thank you for attending this session of what's next for real estate and the life experience. We'll see you next time.